Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The smell of fresh ink on paper, the crack of the spine, the sight of one's book on a bookstore shelf, these are the things that make publishing so alluring. However, the chances of getting represented by a literary agent, then having one's manuscript accepted by a publisher, are pretty slim. There seems to be gatekeepers every step of the way. Chuck Ross met those gatekeepers before. During the 1970s, Ross had been an aspiring mystery novelist, making ends meet by selling cable TV subscriptions door to door. When the day was done and his feet were sore from walking all over Santa Monica, California, Ross sat down at his typewriter to put words on the page. He spent nights and weekends plotting out a mystery novel he was sure would become a hit. Ross knew he would be one of a hundred other authors mailing in their books to prospective publishing houses that month, So he did something to stand out. He fixed a seal over the last few pages to hide the big reveal. If an editor had gotten to the point and wanted to see how it ended, they could break the seal and read on. Ross sent his manuscript to over a dozen publishers and then waited for their request to pour in. Weeks later, his mailbox started filling up and Ross noticed something peculiar. Not only had every publishing house rejected him, but many had barely read the manuscript at all. Most had still left the seal in place over the last few pages. Another writer might have sent their novel out to different publishers, or tried their luck with literary agents. Not Ross. He got to work on another book right away, except this time he branched out from the mystery genre. His next manuscript was a collection of short stories and conversations told from a first-person point of view. None of the characters or settings had names, and its subject matter was much more serious than a simple whodunit, It touched upon a man's life in Poland controlled by the Soviet Union, followed by the character's eventual move to the United States. He touched upon themes of capitalism, violence, sexuality, and loneliness. It was his finest work, and a stark departure from the kind of material he had tried to get published before. Ross mailed out sample pages to four publishers, and just like before, each publisher sent back a rejection letter. But he wouldn't give up. He continued to work on his story collection until it was ready to send out in its entirety. In 1979, he submitted the full book under the pseudonym Eric Demos to 14 more major publishers. Apparently, the extra work didn't help. Ross received rejection after rejection from every editor who read his book. They called his prose lucid, but his content uninspiring. Literary agents responded the same way, all 26 that Ross had reached out to. It seemed nobody wanted his new book, which was surprising considering it had already won the National Book Award. Ross's collection, titled Steps, wasn't actually his to begin with. It had been written by author Jerzy Kaczynski in 1968. You see, Ross, frustrated by publishers' indifference to his first novel, had wanted to try a little experiment. He retyped several pages of Kaczynski's second book, which had already sold over 400,000 copies by that time and sent them in under a different name. When that didn't work, he tried again with the whole book, only to achieve the same results. What had surprised him the most, though, was one publisher's decision not to accept it. After all, they had been the real publisher of Kaczynski's book, the one that Ross had retyped. Another publisher who had released Kaczynski's first novel admired the writing and style of Steps, going as far as to compare it to the work of one of their own authors, Jerzy Kaczynski. Unfortunately, it just didn't, as they put it, add up to a satisfactory whole. Sadly, Ross's stunt didn't earn him his own book deal, but he did write a piece about it for a popular magazine, which led to a new career as a freelance journalist for publications like The Hollywood Reporter and San Francisco Chronicle. But Ross wasn't ready to give up his experiments just yet. He tried his luck one last time in 1982, except instead of testing the saleability of best-selling novels, he used an iconic film. He sent 217 Hollywood agencies a copy of his brand new script, Everybody Comes to Rick's. It told the story of a club owner during World War II who helps his long-lost love and her new husband 
who are rebels on the run from the Germans. Ninety agencies refused to read it due to a policy regarding unsolicited submissions. Eight felt it was too similar to another film, and 38 agencies flat out rejected it. They said Ross's dialogue was excessive and the storyline was weak, among other negative comments. 33 agencies, though, recognized what they'd been sent. One agent went so far as to tell the writer that he'd already seen the film 147 times. If you haven't guessed already, Ross had mailed out the script for Casablanca. Suffice it to say, his prank was not the start of any beautiful friendships. We can't always help who we become. So much of who we are is grounded in what we come from. It's no surprise that children of musicians often start bands of their own, or that sons and daughters of famous actors become stars in their own rights. Frances didn't have a chance, either. Her parents, Ethel and Frank Gum, had been vaudevillian entertainers before settling down in Grand Rapids. They ran a movie theater together, which featured a stage where their fellow vaudevillians would perform. Together, they had three children— Mary Jane, Dorothy Virginia, and Frances, the youngest. Frances was born in 1922 and was performing for audiences by the time she was just two years old. Her debut came when she walked onto the stage during a Christmas show at her parents' theater, singing Jingle Bells alongside her two sisters. It was an act that would seal her fate and her future forever. The family was forced to move a few years later after illicit rumors started to swirl about her father. Frank Ethel and the girls headed west to Lancaster, California, where he took an ownership of another theater. Ethel, on the other hand, had no interest in running a theater again. Instead, she saw something special in her daughters, and how audiences reacted when they performed. She became their manager, signing them up for dance lessons to help them break into the movies. Her efforts took a toll on her marriage, though. Ethel was often away from home with the girls as she hauled them from audition to audition, while Frank watched the theater and the young men who worked there. Frances, Mary Jane, and Virginia Dorothy got their first taste of fame in short films, which they performed in together from the late 20s to the mid-30s. Under their mother's guidance, they even sang and danced their way onto the vaudevillian circuit, taking the stage together as the Gum Sisters. Unfortunately, the name didn't wow audiences. A theater in Chicago once listed them as the Glum Sisters, They changed their last name after that, though the origins of the change are still contested to this day. A common story claims that vaudeville star George Jessel inspired their new surname after commenting on their beauty during a show. As with other duos and trios in Hollywood's heyday, one member always stood apart from the rest. For the sisters, it was Frances. Burton Lang, a songwriter for MGM Studios, had been in the audience at the Paramount Theater when the sisters came on stage to perform. As soon as Frances opened her mouth, Lane was sold. He called the head of the studio's music department, Jack Robbins, to tell him about the young girl's amazing voice. Frances was invited to MGM the following day for an audition. She arrived with her father and performed two songs with Burton Lang, accompanying her on piano. When it was over, Robbins ran out of the room. Minutes later, he came back with the head of MGM himself, Louis B. Mayer who was so floored by her singing he paraded writers, producers, and directors from all over Hollywood through the room to hear her. Frances's marathon audition had begun at 9 o'clock in the morning and didn't finish until 7.30 at night, but it had done the trick. The Gum Sisters were no more. Only Frances had been signed to MGM. She started attending school at the studio while acting and singing in big-budget motion pictures. She practically grew up in the Hollywood system, going from a straight-laced girl next door to the sophisticated songstress she was known as later in life. Over the course of her career, she would perform in over 25 films with such stars as Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, Angela Lansbury, and Mary Astor. Sadly, her father never got to see the little girl become the star. On November 16th of 1935, Frank Gum was diagnosed with meningitis. Frances, then 13 at the time, was singing on an NBC radio show while her father was in the hospital. He passed away the next day. But he would have been proud of her, watching her rise to the status of cultural icon. Though the world would never whisper the name of Francis Gum among Hollywood legends, they would certainly come to know and practically revere 
the girl who traveled somewhere over the rainbow to become none other than Judy Garland. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.